Well, last fortnight, <clears throat> you'll recall we began with Romans chapter 9. The section I've highlighted there in orange, those three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, the righteousness of God with Israel. And uh, we made the point at the time, this is two weeks ago, that, that, that this section forms somewhat of a climax to the argument of the apostle that he's making in the book of Romans. A climax, that is to say, as opposed to simply concluding in chapter 8, which has often been the practice. When you get to chapter 9, you see the apostle has so successfully argued that righteousness doesn't come by law and that salvation is available to Gentiles as well as Jews, that there's likely to be, by the start of chapter 9, a considerable Jewish feeling against him. And further than that, it begs the ultimate question. Does God still have a purpose with the nation of Israel? If the apparently whole reason that that nation came into existence, that is the Mosaic Code, the priesthood, the prophets, if all of that, if none of that rather, can give you eternal life, what was the value of it? And further, does God still have a a purpose with the people to whom it was originally given? Well, The answer, of course, is in the affirmative, but here's the structure as we began to see it of chapters 9, 10, and 11. What was the story, briefly, of chapter 9? Well, the apostle begins the chapter, you'll recall, with a genuine distress for the predicament of the nation. His distress for them wasn't just that they didn't believe, but that they did so in the face of such enormous privileges as they'd been given. The greatest of which, of course, was the Messiah himself came from among them. But as he goes on to explain, the fact that Israel didn't believe what God said didn't mean that God's purpose with them had failed. Didn't mean that at all, because God never ever promised that he'd save every Jew. Abraham, for example, had two children. One was God's seed, one wasn't God's seed. Well, the Jew looked at that and said, well, that's very simple, They had different mothers. One was a Jew, one wasn't a Jew. It's very easy. So Paul moves to the next generation. Well, what about Isaac? He also had two children. Two boys. Twins, in fact, from the same mother. Yet still only one was God's seed. And they might have both been Jews in that sense. It becomes, from that, you see, very clear that fleshly descent doesn't of itself make you a child of God. But there was more to that in the case of Jacob and Esau, however, wasn't there? Because not only was Jacob selected over Esau, but the decision was made before the boys were even born, before they had even done good or evil. Now, what does that prove? Well, that proves, if it proves anything, it proves that works of law don't commend you to God because neither boy had the chance to do anything, good or bad. Just stop for a moment and think about the power of that argument. I actually think that's brilliant logic that the apostle uses. You know, we're only what, a dozen verses or so into chapter 9, and he's already demolished the whole uh, pedigree, if you like, of the Jewish argument. So God... Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have to save every Jew to save the whole nation of Israel. Moses, as we found by his prayers, couldn't save the whole nation. Pharaoh, by his stubbornness, couldn't destroy the whole nation. God's purpose with the nation would be accomplished, but it wouldn't involve every individual born into that nation. Well, then the question arises, of course, halfway through chapter 9. Well, if God raises up people like Pharaoh with a stubborn heart, simply so that he can use them as his will describes, how can he ever condemn Pharaoh for resisting his will? Isn't Pharaoh merely doing what God's made him do? Is man still responsible for his own actions? The answer comes back once again in the affirmative. Yes, of course. It all has to do with how the clay responds to the potter. And the simple answer is that the potter will continue to work with the clay so long as the clay is malleable. Vessels are only destroyed when they're beyond help. Furthermore, in accordance with God's long-suffering, he didn't destroy Pharaoh as quickly as he might have, but used him to save other people, not willing, you see, that any should perish. And since salvation now depends on God's mercy rather than on man's nationality, well then Gentiles, as well as Jews, can be saved. 
and towards the end of the chapter he quotes four quotations, two from Hosea and two from Isaiah. Two quotations from Hosea to prove that not all Gentiles would be lost, two quotations from Isaiah to prove that not all Jews would be saved. So some, would be, some Jews would be saved, uh, though they had all the advantages. Some Gentiles would be saved, though they had none of the advantages. It was all a question, you see, of how you sought God, which is how chapter 9 finishes from verses 30 to 33. <coughs> the Gentiles sought God by faith. The Jews sought him by works. And you've got a couple of phrases in verses 30 and 31 which describe how, how the apostle describes those, those two approaches to salvation. The Gentiles attain, at the end of verse 30, the righteousness which is of faith. The Jews uh, follow, in the middle of verse 31, the law of righteousness, or righteousness by law, which, of course, is no righteousness at all, but that was the pursuit they made, you see. And, and that was what characterised the Jewish versus the Gentile approach to salvation before God. Righteousness by faith or righteousness by law. As a consequence of that, the Gentiles found God, but the Jews did not, because they searched in all the wrong places and with all the wrong method. And you see, that's the real tragedy of Romans chapter 9. You think of all the blessings given to the Jews as compared with the Gentiles. Like the enormous number of blessings, beginning with manna in the wilderness, beginning with the crossing of the Red Sea for the next 1,500 years until the apostles writing this in the first century. <coughs> the law, the prophets, the priesthood, even the Messiah, all came to that nation. But far from assisting their salvation, you might, you might, when you look back at history, you might think those blessings were more of a curse than a blessing. Because by the end of the first century, not only was the Messiah dead, the nation in dispersion, but by all conservative estimates, the, Jew, the Gentiles overwhelmingly outnumbered the Jews in the ecclesial world. And as we closed last week, we made the point that these are lessons that you can never ever lose sight of yourselves in the truth. Because you see, the day we take the truth for granted, the day we stop taking God at his word, the day we read into our Bibles what we want to read into them rather than what they say is the day we begin on the slippery slope that Israel took, isn't it? And it's as simple as that. That's exactly what happened to them. They looked for God in all the wrong places, by which I mean they looked for him in the wrong way. They recreated God. Well, that brings us now to chapter 10, because when you come to chapter 10, there's a difference as compared with chapter 9. In chapter 9, the main focus, as, you, as I've just described that story to you, you can see that the main focus of the chapter is upon God and God's dealings with Israel. You, you might say that chapter 9 is Paul's interrogation of God on Israel's behalf. When you come to chapter 10, it's the opposite. It's Paul's interrogation of Israel on God's behalf. Because now the tables are turned. You see, by the time you get to the end of chapter 9, Israel might have been able to claim that perhaps they hadn't been given a fair chance as compared with the Gentiles. That they weren't really aware of the consequences of their disobedience. That God was more merciful to the Gentiles than he should have been. Perhaps he's more merciful to the Gentiles than he even was to them. And that now begets the story of chapter 10, as you can see halfway down the slide there. Verses 1 to 4. The self-righteousness of Israel. What's happening here? Well, before the apostle embarks on his interrogation of the nation, he repeats again his concern for the plight of his countrymen. That's what these opening verses begin with. He repeats the, the very similar words to what you saw at the outset of chapter 9. And then verses 5 to 10 of chapter 10, two modes of righteousness. We met them as I described them in chapter 9, verses 30 and 31. Righteousness by law versus righteousness by faith. I mean, they're not, well, I suppose they are two methods of righteousness. One's called self-righteousness. The other is called godly righteousness. But nevertheless, two modes of righteousness as the apostle begins to describe them. This was the Jewish approach versus the Gentile approach to the truth. One right, one wrong. Verses 11 to 13, 
righteousness is available to Jew and Gentile. Or if you like, salvation is available to Jew and Gentile. Why is that? Well, because righteousness comes by faith and not by works of law. Therefore, you didn't have to be under the law. Therefore, you didn't have to be a Jew born into the Mosaic Covenant. You didn't have to be any of those things to still be saved. And if salvation is available to those outside the law, then clearly it's available to Gentiles. Verses 14 to 18, Scripture anticipates the preaching to the Gentiles. Don't be surprised by that, says Paul. Scripture always said that the truth would be preached to the Gentiles. It was always part of God's plan, and he goes, quote, 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 to prove it. And then concludes the chapter in the last few verses, 19 to 21, and when the truth is preached to the Gentiles, as compared with the Jews, they will accept it, and they will approach God in the appropriate manner. All right, chapter 10 and verse 1. <clears throat> Brethren, he says, <clears throat> My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So the closing verses of chapter 9 speak about the fact that the Gentiles attained unto righteousness, whereas the Jews didn't. Paul now is going to elaborate that on that in this chapter, but he's going to prefix his remarks with a restatement of his pure motive. This is, as I said a moment ago, this is very similar language to the opening words of chapter 9. Because he's at pains to point out that his criticism of the nation, which is going to follow, is not because he's having a go at them. It's because he cares about their eternal well-being. My prayer, he says, is that they might be saved. So if a perfect man couldn't get, <laughs> couldn't get life out of the law, whoever could? If the law couldn't even give life to a perfect man, then what could it do for anyone? That's the second way, of course, in which Christ becomes the end of the law. He's the only one that could actually offer a solution to sin because even the law couldn't do that. Well, of course, the Jew wasn't all that easily convinced because look at verse 5. And verses 5 to 10 are now where the apostle really hops into the heart of the subject. Two modes of righteousness. Now, what's going to happen here is this. The Jew, of course, thinks he's got scripture on his side. <clears throat> In verse 5, he's going to quote, or Paul, on his behalf, is going to quote Leviticus 18 and verse 5 to prove that you absolutely can get eternal life from the law of Moses. You can get eternal life from keeping law, because this is what the Jew believed. Now, what I'm going to say is, that the way Paul writes Romans 10 verse 5 is that he writes it the way the Jew would read it. He doesn't agree with this, this natural interpretation of verse 5 here. It's not true that you can get eternal life out of the law of Moses, but the Jew believes you could. So he, he accepts the quotation and puts it on the table as the Jew would have tabled it. And then he's going to answer it from verses 6 to 8 by quoting Deuteronomy chapter 30 to prove that that was never God's intention. God never intended, ever, that you would get eternal life from the law of Moses. So let's see how he does it. Look at verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. You remember that? I've made that point before. The righteousness of the law, chapter 9, verse 31, compared with the righteousness of faith, chapter 9, verse 30. So here's the righteousness of the law in verse 5. And you'll see the righteousness of faith in verse 6. It's these two modes of righteousness. One, a bogus mode of righteousness, yes, yes, but two contrasted modes of righteousness nevertheless. Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. And when we read live by them, the Jew read live eternally by them. That is, if you kept the law of Moses, you could have eternal life. All right. That's going to pose us a problem, of course, because if the Jew's right, well, then there are evidently two ways of achieving eternal life. One by works of law and another by faith. The fastest way, you know, to establish the apostles' true position on this subject is to come to Galatians 3. So do that with me now. Galatians it's like a mini Romans. 
It's arguing much the same subject, but in a whole lot less chapters. Because, of course, he's dealing, in, at least in Galatia, with a substantially Gentile audience, whereas in Rome it, was, it had a far higher Jewish population, at least at certain times. Galatians 3 and verse 11. Here it is. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, he says, for, Habakkuk 2 verse 4, the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but, Leviticus 18 verse 5, that's our quote, the man that doeth them shall live in them. So, clearly what he's saying in verses 11 and 12 of Galatians 3 is that the law can't give you eternal life because he's making, a, he's making a contrast here. It's evident, he says, that no man is justified by law. But he goes on in verse 12 and says, but you can still have life through the law. So you say, well, well how does that make sense? Can you get life by law or can you not? Well, whatever the form of life was that the law of Moses could give you, evidently wasn't eternal life because that would require justification in verse 11 or forgiveness, if you like. So what could the law give you? What could the law of Moses actually do for you? Well, this is what Moses says. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 46, he says to them, <coughs> Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you, because it is your life. And through this thing you shall prolong your days in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. So there's the answer. What sort of a life could the law of Moses give you? Answer, long life in the land. Not eternal life. So yes, the law could give life, but not the kind of life we want to talk about. It could prolong your life in the land. And that was all the law could give you. It was never intended to be able to give you eternal life. So what we're saying is that the Jew is misreading Leviticus 18 and verse 5 when he says that you could get life from the law of Moses. It's talking about a different kind of life. You want to see how powerfully the apostle makes that point? You come over the page to Galatians 3 and verse 21. Look. Think about this from God's point of view. Galatians 3 verse 21. Is the law of Moses then against the promises of God? By no means. For if there had been a, a law given which could have given life, I mean eternal life, if there had been a law given that could have, that could have given eternal life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. God says... If, trust me, if it was possible that I could give mankind eternal life by having him follow a law, any law, I would have done it rather than killed my son. But it wasn't possible that eternal life could come by a law. Not possible. And therefore I had to send my son, who would be the end of the law. Galatians 3.24, and the law was a teacher to take you to that point. So on every count, God would have loved to have provided a law that could have given life because he could have kept his son intact, but it was an, an impossibility. So not only is the Jew wrong in his reading of Leviticus 18 and verse 5 by reference, for example, to Deuteronomy 32, he's wrong even from the, the perspective of God who, as a consequence of the law not being able to give eternal life, had to sacrifice his own son. Now let's look at the other side of the argument. You come with me to Luke chapter 10. The beginning of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ now, and he's going to use Leviticus 18 and verse 5. Same quote. So you, you're seeing this quote appear in Romans chapter 10, in Galatians chapter 3, and now in Luke chapter 10. And look at this, verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. <clears throat> Behold a certain lawyer. So this fellow ought to know something about the law, because he's a 
lawyer. A certain lawyer stood up and tempted Christ, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? All right, so now we've got a lawyer who's, a, who's skilled in the law talking about how you get eternal life. Like It's all the ingredients we want, isn't it? And Jesus said to him, well, what's written in the law? How readest thou? And the lawyer answered and said, well, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbour as thyself. And Jesus said to the lawyer, thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. And you'll have a little Q, sorry, a little G in your margin, which takes you to Leviticus 18 and verse 5. Now, what does Jesus mean by that? Because when he says in verse 28, this do and thou shalt live, he means live eternally. Because that was the question in verse 25. So Jesus, can you see the point? Jesus is quoting Leviticus 18 and verse 5 as a proof of eternal life by law. Or is he? Not quite. Which part of the law was the lawyer going to, have, going to have to keep to get eternal life? Well, all that part in verse 27. Loving God with his heart, soul, mind and strength and his neighbour as himself. It would require a change of heart by the lawyer. Not simply a compunction to do works. Jesus said, if your heart was to change... You're no longer a legalist. You're going to develop a character of faith or belief in God. And that's what will give you eternal life. So what's the point? The point is this, very simply. The law, as mere law, could never give you eternal life. But it could lead you to eternal life by teaching you faith. And it's faith that would give you eternal life. There would be many thousands, <coughs> perhaps hundreds of thousands of Jews, all of those years under the Mosaic Covenant, who will be in the kingdom of God on the basis of faith, but who grew up under law. Because that law was a schoolmaster to them to lead them to the kind of character they had to develop. Jesus says, do that and you'll have eternal life. Not by law. Not simply by keeping the rules of law without any change of heart. But if your heart was to change, then all of a sudden you're going to get eternal life on the basis of something other than law. So the law couldn't give you life, but it could lead you to life. Well, that's how Paul answers Leviticus 18 and verse 5 in Galatians 3. That's how Jesus answers it in Luke 10. Come back to Romans. How does the apostle answer it in Romans 10? Well, this is how. In verse 6, he's going to quote Deuteronomy 30 against the Jewish misinterpretation of Leviticus 18, verse 5, which you've just read of in verse 5 of Romans 10. So verse 6... <coughs> But the righteousness which is of faith, all right? So we've got the righteousness by law in verse 5, contrasted now with the righteousness which is of faith in verse 6, speaks on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? What saith the law of Moses? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now here are those words. Here on the screen is the, is the original from Deuteronomy chapter 30. What's the, what's the wider context of what Deuteronomy is saying? Well, Romans 10 verses 6 to 8 quote Deuteronomy 30 verses 12 to 14. Starting at verse 11 of Deuteronomy 30, it says this. For this commandment which I command thee this day, Moses says, is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. <coughs> it's not in heaven that you, that you have to say, who's going to go up to us for heaven and bring it down? And, and it's not beyond the sea that thou should say, who should go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? 
But the word is very nigh thee, he says, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. You don't have to run far to find out what God requires of you, said Moses. See, he says, I've set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. And that I command thee this day to love Yahweh thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes and judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply in the land whether thou goest to possess it. So, he says, hmm, you don't have to go far to find the commandment of God. I'm instructing you to love Yahweh your God (coughs) and to keep all his commandments that you might live in the land where you're currently dwelling now, he says. That's the context that the Apostle's quoting here from Deuteronomy chapter 30. So, what's his answer? How does that answer the, the misquote that the Jew gives in verse 5 of this chapter, of uh, Romans 10. Well, what the apostle does is, by quoting Deuteronomy 30, gives a great list of all the things you don't have to do in order to have life. Because you see what the point is of, of quoting Leviticus 18 and verse 5 in verse 5 of Romans is to say that you can have righteousness or you can have salvation by keeping law. He immediately puts up against that a quote that says, you don't have to keep anything. You can find the word of God right next to you and all you've got to do is believe it with all your heart and love the God that gave it. So he says, you've got to to change your heart. You don't have to climb the highest mountain, scale the works of the law to heaven, swim the greatest... You don't have to do any of that. You've just got to believe with your heart and confess with your mouth. The trick is, however, that Paul has made some changes to Deuteronomy 30 when he quotes it in Romans 10. Beyond the sea, as you'll see on the screen, has been changed to descend into the abyss or the, the, or the grave. The word, the word deep here doesn't mean a deep ocean. It's the word abusos. It means the grave. He's added these little parenthetic statements at the end of verse 6 and at the end of verse 7. <clears throat> they don't appear anywhere in Deuteronomy chapter 30. So how does, how does Paul know that, that Moses is talking about Christ in Deuteronomy chapter 30? I mean, how would you have known to have put that into Deuteronomy 30? And the answer is, I believe, I don't think Moses especially was talking about Christ. But the apostle has just made the point in verse 4 that Christ is the end of the law. That is, when the law, that the law finishes when Christ comes. And therefore, he can replace everything that Moses says about the law in Deuteronomy 30 with Christ. Because Christ is simply the sequel to the law. And that's what he does. That's all he does. Simply extrapolates Moses' chapter about the law and replaces the law with Christ. And therefore, in the same way the Jew didn't have to ascend to heaven or descend the deep to serve God, neither do we. God's already done far greater works than we can ever do. And he's provided his son right there. You've just got to believe on him. You've just got to copy him. You don't have to go far to find out what that example looks like. In fact, there's really only one thing God hasn't done. I mean, he's conquered every height and every depth, He's brought Christ down from heaven. He's raised him from the dead. Far greater works, if you like, far greater works than any law could compel a man to do. God's already done that. So so what further works do you think you're going to add to that? But there's one work that God hasn't done. And it's the only work he hasn't done because he can't do it. That is, to forcibly take control of our hearts. He hasn't done that. That's up to us. And as it turns out, as you know, as I know, giving over control of your heart is the hardest thing you'll ever ever be asked to do. I'm not talking about giving away your heart in marriage. I'm saying giving away your free will to your heavenly father. That's a much harder thing. Certainly in the case of Israel, it turned out to be impossible, didn't it? Completely impossible. They would much rather have scaled the enormous mountain of works over 1,500 years by the nation. They'd rather try and climb that to get to heaven than to give away control of their hearts. It wasn't possible. It wasn't the form of righteousness God was looking for. And therefore, they came up with nothing. 
And then Paul concludes in verse 8 by speaking about the heart and the mouth. <coughs> what saith it? That is, what saith the law? The, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, he says. Well, that mouth and heart now becomes a bit of a theme. It began in verse 6, if you like. Say, not in thy heart, what works shall we do? That is, say with your mouth, not in your heart, what works shall we do? No works, he says. I want you to believe. That's the work. So no great physical work. The Jews looking for crowning acts of achievement. They don't exist, says God. I want a change of heart. Verse 9. Do this. If you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? Confess that he, that he lived? Confess that he died 2,000 years ago? What does it mean to confess the, with thy mouth the Lord Jesus? Well, I think you've got the clue in the second half of the verse. With your mouth you confess the Lord Jesus. Put that to one side. And with your heart, you have to believe that God raised him from the dead. Ah, now that helps us because in verses 6 and 7... You've got those ideas. In verse 6, he concludes by saying that God brought Christ down from heaven. And in verse 7, he says that he raised him from the dead. Ah, so you see what this is about? When it says in verse 9 that you should confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, what it means is that you should confess that God brought him down from heaven. And when it says that you believe in your heart, believe in your heart, you're going to believe that God brought Christ again from the dead. You see, those, those are the two parenthetic additions of verses 6 and 7. And all, the, all Paul has done in, in, in verses 6 and 7 <coughs> is taken Moses from Deuteronomy 30 and, and completed the ellipsis for the Christian era and then said, these are the things you've got to believe. Well, of course, for the unconverted Jew, they were almost monumental obstacles. How would he ever... When it says for the Jew that he's got to confess with his mouth uh, the Lord Jesus, that is, that God brought Christ down from above, he's got to confess that he's son of God and son of man. That's what he would be required to confess. Not just believe Jesus Christ was a carpenter's son, but confess that he was the son of God, that he came from above. And what's more, that he came, having been killed, from beneath as well. Do that, the apostle says, and you'll, have, you'll be saved. That's not all there is to it, however. What does he say in verse 9? Speak with your mouth and believe with your heart. I mean, what else are you going to speak with? And what else are you going to believe with? What was he have to say that? And the point is, <coughs> if you want to have to be saved, he says, you've got to use your heart and your mouth, not your feet and your hands. It's not that works aren't important, but that salvation comes by faith. Salvation doesn't come by works. That's the point he's making in verse 9. And so verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, he says. And that's why the heart and mouth are important. Look, here's Psalm 51. O Yahweh, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For the, thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest not in burnt offering. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God <coughs> are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. That's why he says you've got to use your heart and your mouth. It's easier to scale a mountain of works with your arms and your legs than to give over your heart or your mouth. It's easier to do the external physical works. He said, no, I want the works that are going to cost you something. I want the works that mean I own your heart and that I encamp within you. That's what he says. <coughs> 
Go back, however, and look at verse 1 when compared with verse 9. Verse 1, the apostle says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. What do you think of that for heart and mouth? My heart's desire and my prayer by mouth to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Verse 9 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, then you'll be saved. He says, well, I'm doing it. I want them saved. So remarkable, in fact, personal, if you like, little fulfillment of the application of verse 9 in the apostle's life with relation to his own countrymen. Well, verses 11 to 13 now form a new section. Having got to the end of verse 10, a new section begins, and we know it's a new section because he's going to talk now about the fact that righteousness is available both to Jews and Gentiles. (coughs) And perhaps the big clue that it's a new section is that verse 11 is the same quotation as you read in chapter 9 and verse 33. It's a quotation from Isaiah 28, verse 16, the same quotation appearing in both places. So you could almost, as a consequence of that, put verses 1 to 10 of Romans 10 in parentheses and read straight from chapter 9, verse 33 into chapter 10, verse 11 and go from Isaiah 28, 16 to Isaiah 28, 16 and carry on. You see, so he really has addressed the section of two forms of righteousness by the end of chapter 10. That is those two forms which you met in chapter 9, verses 30 and 31. Well, (coughs) new section, yes. Righteousness available to Jew and Gentile, yes. He's made the point, you see, that salvation comes by faith, as opposed to being through law. And, And that the Jew wasn't really saved by works at all as a consequence of that. And if works no longer count towards salvation, then the Jew wasn't really, in that sense, therefore any different to the Gentile. No man commends himself to God by works of law. Therefore, any man who approaches God on the basis of faith can be saved. Therefore, the hope of salvation applies equally to Jews as it does to Gentiles. So verse 11. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And the emphasis here is on the word whosoever. Jew or Greek, whosoever. But look at the quotation. Isaiah 28, 16, as I said. Same as chapter 9, verse 33. So salvation's open to everyone. Verse 12. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So not only are Jews and Greeks all reduced by a common subjection to sin, but we're all equally under the lordship of the same God. And before God, therefore, there's no difference between Jew and Greek. The Apostle Peter paraphrases this point in Acts chapter 11 when he speaks to Cornelius in Acts 11 and verses 34 to 36. I perceive God's no respecter of persons, he says. In every nation, he that fears God and worketh righteousness is accepted by him through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. And that's what verse 12 says. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So Peter picks the the very same point up. Verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, you might look at this and say, why are we repeating ourselves? Don't you think verse 13 says... Almost exactly the same thing as verse 11. I mean, verse uh, verse 11 is a quotation from Isaiah 28, verse 16. Verse 13 is a quotation from Joel 2, verse 32. So they're different quotations, but they're saying basically the same thing. Why would you pull two quotations to say exactly the same thing? What are they saying? They're saying that salvation is available to Jews as well as Gentiles, or, or, or Gentiles as well as Jews. Well, I'll show you the answer to that in a moment, but let's make one point about verse 13 before we do. I mean, it's obvious what it's saying. <coughs> the Pentecostals, however, make a meal out of verse 13 and verse 11 because they say that 
What these verses prove is that works have got no importance whatsoever. Once you're saved, you're always saved, because it says so in Romans chapter 10. Well, as you now can see, the context of these verses is not the summary of the requirements for salvation. The context of the verses is all about the, the, the sort of people who are eligible for salvation. By no means could you read these verses to say that that's all you need to do to be saved. Proof of that would be this. Acts 2 verse 20, 21, which <coughs> is in the margin beside verse 13. Acts 2 21 quotes the same quotation from Joel 2 uh, on an occasion where Peter baptises 3,000 people. So he says, uh, 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 there's more to simply calling upon the name of the Lord. Peter, Peter quotes the very same quotation and then baptises 3,000 people. So you could at least say baptism is essential in addition to simply calling upon the name of the Lord. All right, but what about our original question? Verses 11 and 13 are sort of duplicates. How come? How come we've quoted both of them? We'll have a look at the screen because it's going to be quicker like this. Do you remember... He raised the issues of the mouth and the heart in verse 8 of this chapter. And you find the mouth and the heart appear again in verse 9. And then they appear again in verse 10. And then, well, verse 10 says, With the heart man believes, and with the mouth he confesses. Can you see that verse 11 is the ultimate conclusion? With the mouth man believes, it says... (laughs) <coughs> with the heart he uh, sorry with the heart man believes and with the mouth he confesses with the heart he believes so verse 11 says whosoever believeth on god shall not be ashamed and with the mouth he confesses verse 13 says and whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved you see that there's the conclusion to the heart and the mouth in verses 11 and 13 yes they say the same thing But that's why the apostles got two quotations there. Because Moses entered the picture with the heart and the mouth. Well, in verse 14, we've got a problem. We're talking now all about Gentiles being saved. The only problem with that great idea is that Gentiles don't know what to call, do they? Because they've never heard the truth. Paul says they should call on the Lord in verse 13. That is the Lord of Jew and Greek in verse 12. That's who the Gentiles should call on. Well, yes, fine, but in order to do that, the Gentiles are going to have to know the truth. To know the truth, they're going to have to hear it. To hear it, they're going to need a preacher. And for there to be a preacher, there's going to have to be a mandate. There's going to have to be a decree by God sending out that preacher. Well, that begs the question. Is there any biblical support for the idea that God ever intended to send preachers to the Gentiles? And the answer is, verse 15, absolutely there is. Isaiah 52, verse 7. How sh- well, verse 14. How shall they call on him in whom they, whom they have not believed? That is, the Gentiles. How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? uh uh but it's written, how beautiful, upon, upon, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things, he says. Here's Isaiah 52. So what you're reading here is Isaiah 52, verse 7. But if I go a little wider in the context of Isaiah 52, look what we found. <coughs> at the top of the screen, I've got verse 7, how beautiful upon the mountains. So that's the quote that the apostle puts in verse 15 here. Uh, The problem is that verse 7 of Isaiah 52 is preaching to Jews. There's a problem with that because this is all about the the gospel going to Jew and Gentile and and the fact that the Gentiles can't call upon the name of God if they've never heard about it. To quote Isaiah 52 verse 7 wouldn't seem to be very fair, would it? Because, well, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that that brings good tidings, that publishes peace, that brings good tidings of good, and that saith unto Zion 
thy God reigneth. That's the preaching to the Jews. But keep reading. The next verse of Isaiah. <coughs> Break forth into joy. Sing together, you places of Jerusalem. Jews. Verse 10 of Isaiah. Yahweh hath made bare his arm in the eyes of all the nations. Gentiles. Verse 15 of Isaiah 52. So shall he sprinkle many nations. So yes, the preaching will go out. And what would be the sequence? Jew first, then Greek. And the, 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 the gospel of peace that began to be preached on the mountains in verse 15 would very soon percolate out to all the nations. That's what would happen, says Isaiah 52. So, the apostle is right in quoting Isaiah 52. You just have to keep reading the verses to find that the gospel, whilst it begins with the Jews, doesn't remain with the Jews. But, verse 16, so the truth's gone out, but they haven't all obeyed the gospel. Yes, true. Because Isaiah said, who hath believed our report? Well, where did Isaiah say that? Isaiah 53 verse 1. So keep reading the story of Isaiah 52. He says, the preachers are going to go, the gospel is going to go, it's going to go to the Jew, the Jew, the, G the Gentile, the Gentile, the Gentile. And they wouldn't all believe, be they Jew or Gentile. They wouldn't all believe. And you're into Isaiah 53, the very chapter of the Messiah. Well, the Jews certainly didn't believe anything about that. And to this day, they don't believe Isaiah 53 is about Christ. They give it a Hezekiah application. Anything. Anything to remove the possibility that they killed the Son of God 2,000 years ago. Well, he says, they wouldn't all believe, but I knew that when I sent the preachers, because Isaiah was written a long time before these preachers went out. So then, verse 17... Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That, in many ways, reiterates what you've just read in verse 14. Verse 14 says that preaching results in hearing, <coughs> which results in believing, which results in calling upon God. Verse 17, or verse 16 and 17 says that the word of God results in hearing, which results in faith, which results in obeying. God. So it's not very complicated, but what you can infer from verse 17 is this. If whatever we say is not soundly based upon the word of God, then it's never going to result in faith. It may result in a convincing argument. You might gain adherence, but you'll never ever develop in them the kind of faith that will save them. It just underlines how closely we've got to stick to scripture in everything we do. Well, the obvious question that arises from all this then is, well, why didn't Israel believe? I mean, you might say that's obvious. They were stubborn. All right. Is there another reason? Think about this from the Jewish point of view. Is there another reason other than abject stubbornness that Israel didn't believe? They heard the Bible, yes, but did they hear the right message? Have they got a mitigation for why they haven't come to the truth? for why they haven't believed God's report. Verse 18. But I say, <coughs> have they not heard? The New International Version says, but I ask, did they not hear? D did Israel not actually get preached to like they should have? The answer is, of course they did. So the NIV actually for verse 18 says, but I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. And then he quotes in verse 18, Psalm 19 and verse 4, which describes the silent witness of creation. So this is the psalm that begins, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day after day the heavens utter speech. Night after night they show knowledge. And what the apostle is doing is to say that the creation about us exhibits the or gives, gives abundant testimony to the existence of a creator. I mean, the message is a very general message, a very blunt message. Blunt, I mean, not a detailed message. But nevertheless testifies to design in a, by a creator. <coughs> he makes the parallel, therefore, between the witness of creation and the witness of God. 
He says, both the, the Bible and creation witness to the glory of God. We've got here, therefore, an unspoken message of the heavens going out to all the earth. In the same way as the gospel is preached to every creature under heaven. So, so uh, creation speaks of the existence of God. The Bible speaks of the existence of God. And the apostle quotes Psalm 90 to 19 to say, and this is how the word went out. Almost like a sunrise illuminating the world so that in 24 hours the truth's gone from one side to the other. That's how he describes it here. Have they not heard, he says? Yes, verily. Their sound went unto all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Now that's interesting, you know. He says here that the, the word of the gospel has gone to the end of the world. In Matthew 24 and verse 14, Jesus said that the gospel would be preached to the end of the world for a witness to all nations and then would the end come. So you see, as Paul writes these very words in verse 18, in about 60, uh, 57 AD, 13 years before the destruction of AD 70, time's ticking away. Because Jesus had already said some 40 odd years earlier, or 30 years earlier than this, that once the gospel got to the end of the world, then would the end of Judah's commonwealth come. That is, when the gospel got to Rome, then would the end come. He's writing to Rome. The end is coming for those of AD 70. And, of course, when that happens, what becomes of the prayer of chapter 10, verse 1? When the nation is all but wiped off the face of the earth, taken in chains to the slave markets of Europe. An ominous verse, actually, embedded in the midst of this chapter. But I say, he says in verse 19, (coughs) did not Israel know, NIV? Again I ask, did not Israel understand? So his, the first question in verse 18 was, is there a chance they didn't hear? No. Verse 19, is there a chance they heard but never ever understood? No. <clears throat> the point is, they were without excuse. God tried very hard and for very long and in plain and simple Well, I was going to say English, but I should say Hebrew. There was no ambiguity about the message. They had ample opportunity. And he's going to quote three scriptures to complete the chapter. In verse 19, he's going to quote Deuteronomy 32, verse 21, to prove that the Gentiles would be called. (coughs) In verse 20, he's going to quote Isaiah 6 and verse 1, to prove that the Gentiles would respond. And in verse 21, he's going to quote Isaiah 65 and verse 2 to prove that Israel would not respond. It was already mapped out. I'm going to call the Gentiles. They are going to respond to that call, and you are not, said Isaiah and Moses. So verse 19. I say, he says, did not Israel know? Didn't they understand? First, Moses says, I'll provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you, he says. No, you understood just fine. And because you understood and still refused, I'm going to send that message to other people to try and incite at least a jealousy in you. It was a vain hope, but I'm at least going to try and do that. But Isaiah, so that's what Moses said. Isaiah was even bolder. In verse 20, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me, he says. Very bold. This is Isaiah 65 and verse 1. Did I say, I think I said before, Isaiah 6 verse 1. This is Isaiah 65 verse 1, sorry. Isaiah puts it in the extreme case here. All Moses said back in verse 19 was that God would provoke Israel by preaching the truth to the Gentiles. What Isaiah says is, 
This is how he's going to do it. He's going to go up to people that don't even know who he is and who don't want to know who he is, who aren't even looking to find out who he is. And he's going to say to them, look, here am I. And they're going to instantly take notice and believe. I mean, that's a little bit different, can you see, to, to going to the Gentiles and tapping them on the shoulder and shaking them out like, like this and saying, look, here's the truth. He goes to the Gentiles who are not wanting to find the truth and just stands there and they instantly make recognition and instantly believe. That's what Isaiah says. And the contrast, verse 21, but to Israel, all day long have I stretched forth my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people, he says. All day long. And despite the fact that Israel was the subject of God's continual entreaty, day after day, year after year, sacrifice after sacrifice, they turned their backs and walked away. And for 1,500 years, Moses, uh, since Moses, God has held out his hands and all they've done is laugh at him. And, you know, as you come now to the end of the chapter, we've also rounded off this argument that began at the end of chapter 9. In chapter 9, verse 30, the Gentiles were not looking for righteousness, but they found it. That's exactly what it says in chapter 10, verse 20. In chapter 9, verses 31 and 32, on the other hand, Israel followed a law of righteousness. They hunted through that law night and day and never found the righteousness of faith. That's exactly what happens in chapter 10, in verse 21. All day long, God says, I stood there before you, arms outstretched. You disobeyed me. You argued with me. You reinterpreted me. You never found me. Though you looked for me with a magnifying glass, you never found me. And of course, as we close it, the risk for us is that we could do exactly the same thing. As we said a little earlier, all it requires us to do to embark on the slippery slope of Israel is to begin to commend ourselves for the things we do. Perhaps for the family we belong to, perhaps for the ecclesia we belong to, perhaps for our legacy and the truth, for the, for the works that we might have done. Not hard for self-justification to begin. And then if we were to take our Bibles and start reading into the messages that we want to hear, or justifications that we want to make, or imprint on these words, God's after our own images. Believing all the while that we would never make the same mistake of Israel, then we've just made the same mistake as Israel. These words, you see, are, are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the age is come. Never let it be said that we never learned from the history of that nation. <clears throat>